The end of the world is a hot topic on everyone's minds today. We see it in movies, we see it, see it in TV shows, uh, video games, billboards. If you go to the health food stores, sometimes you see the new age movement and, and, and diseases that are going on around the world and everybody is concerned about the end of this world. What will cause this great event? What will be the catapult that will lead the world to its end? What will it be like after the catastrophe? There is no escaping the idea that the human race is catapulting itself to the end of the age. Listen to this. In 2015, there was an estimated cost of $35 billion in damage due to over 300 different natural disasters worldwide. I'm gonna say that again because I want it to be clear. $35 billion worth of natural disaster damages just in 2015. But listen to this, this is more uh, intense. This $35 billion is only 31% short of the 15 year average. Did you hear that? This $35 billion that took place in one year is only 15%, excuse me, 31% short of the 15 year average. So in one year, we're only 31% short of a 15 year average in natural disaster damages going on around the world. The astrophysicist Stephen Hawking suggests that the end of the world will be brought about through the conduit of man-made events. These man-made events include nuclear warfare, global warming, genetically engineered viruses. NASA is obsessed with finding life on other planets. The world, everyone in the world knows that this planet is leading to destruction. And they are looking out in the stars, seeing if we can form life on other planets, if we can go and settle there. And even Hollywood is, is uh, grabbing hold of this idea and they are saying, let's make movies about the Martian. He's not even a Martian. He's from Earth. All you need to do, brothers and sisters, is turn on the news. And there it is, black and white, clear. The signs of the end of the world. What's going to happen next? Jesus was very true when he said in Luke chapter 21 and verse number 26, it says, men's hearts are failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. Men are running to and fro, don't know where to go, looking for answers in different places except where God has given to it us clearly. God has given to us clearly in his word. We don't have to guess. We don't have to make up theories. We don't have to be confused about this topic. The Bible is clear. And that's why we are going to use it this morning. The Bible is clear and we will look at the coming events that will give us the precise answer to when will the end be. The title of this message is, When Will the End Be? Let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will be with us this morning. I pray that you will open our minds and our hearts to hear your words from your Bible. I pray, Father, that you will prepare us for your second coming, that you will point out to us the times in which we are living so we will be ready. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will change our hearts, that we will leave here differently from how we came in this morning. I pray, Father, that your words will, be, will speak life, encourage us, and hasten your second coming. And as always, Father, I pray that I will decrease and you will increase. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 in your Bibles. In Matthew chapter 24. Brethren, maybe if you can turn me down just a little bit. I know I tend to talk loud and I don't want to hurt anyone's ears. Matthew chapter 24. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. As Adventists, we know this chapter very well, correct? Matthew chapter 24. Well, we're going to start at verse number one and look at it again. Amen? 
Because what I want to identify today is what four things must take place before Jesus returns. The Bible is very clear, and when these things happen, Jesus will come. So in Matthew chapter 24, in verse number one, are you there, saints? It says this, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Verse number two, and Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse number three, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. They were leaving the city of Jerusalem. They were leaving the temple and the disciples grabbed Jesus by the shoulder and said, look at this magnificent building in Cleburne. Look how beautiful it is. It's white. And, and, and the descriptions of the temple uh, said that there were the, the, the pinnacle on the top, the dome that was at the top glistened in the sun and it looked like the temple was on fire. It was gold and it was reflective. Beautiful. And Jesus said to them, there will not be one stone left upon another. And immediately when Jesus said that, the disciples said, it must be the end of the world because this is the most magnificent building in the world. And many of us may have thought of that when 9-11 took place planes flying into buildings and saying, this must be the end of the world. How could this happen to us in the United States? Imagine, brothers and sisters, if the, if the White House, you're, on, you're watching the news and the White House just explodes. You would say, this must be the end of the world. And that's exactly the attitude the disciples had. And they said, Jesus, tell us when these things shall come to pass. What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Listen to how Jesus opens his answer in verse number four. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that what? Take heed no man deceive you. It's very interesting, brothers and sisters, that before Jesus even gets into the signs of the times or the coming of his second coming or the end of the world, he starts by saying, let no man deceive you. And yet we had Y2K. How many remember that? Rumors of World War III always taking place year in and year out. In 2012, they said the Mayan calendar was coming to an end. This must be the end of the world. And Jesus said it clearly in verse number four, let no man deceive you. Verse five, for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. And we are being deceived today. Just turn on the uh, church channels on your TV. Send me $1,000 and I'll send you this holy towel. <laughs> I know we are chuckling, brothers and sisters, but it's serious. People are actually giving money to them and, and they're receiving this towel saying that this towel is going to bring me salvation. And we are being deceived, primed for the great deception. Verse number six, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And we see this happening now. Wars and rumors of wars. Every time we turn around, there's a new war, a new country that's in upheaval against another country. Verse number seven, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And I was telling somebody this the other day that I remember when I was a child, I was born in 1982, just to let you know, I was born in 1982 and there was no such thing as having an earthquake here in Dallas. And really, back then, and many of you were born before that, back then, the only places that had earthquakes was California. Not today. Earthquakes happening all over the world, and we as a church are still asleep. 
And Jesus gave it to us plainly right here. And that's just one pestilence and earthquakes and, and famines. And there's not enough food to go around the world. And there's people in other countries dying. These things are happening now. Verse number eight. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall, shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Are you ready for that? And just because it's not happening here in the United States doesn't mean it's not happening in other places around the world. For people are giving up their lives for the faith and we don't even knock on doors in a land of peace and safety. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And this is, brothers and sisters, please, I, I don't want you to take my words incorrectly, but when all we get up here and say is just love Jesus, Faith without works is dead. There needs to be an internal realization and an and internal struggle that God will allow us to be changed. And it's a war. That's why the, the spiritual says, I'm going to lay down my burdens down by the riverside to study war no more. But not yet. It's going to be a fight for your life. And you're going to have to wrestle. And I know that's contrary to the gospel that we hear today, but you are going to have to put forth your best effort. Every fiber of your being will have to plead to God to say, I'm not letting you go unless you change me. Verse number 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, I remember a time, or at least I have been told about a time, where everyone knew their neighbors. Today, brothers and sisters, your neighbor could be dead at their house for months on end, and you would never know it. There was this, uh, a few months back, or maybe a, a few years ago, there was this game called the knockout game. And what they would do in these big cities was a, a group of kids would, would collect together and they would say, they would just choose somebody by random and one of the kids would go and try to knock this person out with one punch. The love of many is verily waxing cold. <laughs> just, I, I, brothers and sisters, it's very clear. All you have to do is open Facebook. And, and there's two people fighting. And rather than breaking this up, let me pull out my phone. I'm, I'm going viral. The love of many shall wax cold. Verse number 13. But he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Remember, brothers and sisters, keep pushing forward regardless what comes in your way. For we are more than conquerors through Christ. Jesus has assured us the victory. He has given it to us on a golden platter, if you will. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, brothers and sisters, the reason why I took us to this passage is because we're trying to identify what four things must take place before Jesus returns. And one of them is given, given to us here in verse number 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And what? Now, many say the gospel must be preached around the world, but that's not what it says. It says, this gospel. Now, any of you English majors out there or teachers know that this is a demonstrative what? Pronoun, that's right. That means it's a specific gospel that must go around the world concerning, in context, the second coming of Christ. It's not just Jesus died on the cross for you. It's more than that. 
And there is a specific message that's going to prepare a people for the second coming of Christ. So we're going to hold here. The first thing that must take place, uh, and they're not in chronological order, okay? There's no specific order. I just started here. But one of the things that must take place before Christ returns is that a particular gospel will go around the world to prepare a people for the second coming of Christ. The gospel is good news. And even though you see these things that, that are, are a, a catastrophe, catastrophical events, it's still good news. Amen. For Jesus said it this way, when you see all these things coming to pass, then what? Okay. Look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go home. Amen. I want to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. I want to be ready when he returns, don't you? Amen. Amen. Let's go on to our second thing that must take place. And consequently, uh, number two and number three are in the same chapter. Amen? Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to start at verse Number one, just so we can get a context of what is going on here. Remember that this gospel must be preached around the world and then shall the end come. Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse number one. Are you there, saints? It says this. Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse number one. It says this. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That, my friends, is what we call the second coming. Number two, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Evidently, brothers and sisters, there were rumors going around at the time when Paul wrote this that they were saying that Jesus had already come. And there are still those rumors today. In fact, there is a group that say, when you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that is the second coming into your heart. But Acts chapter 2 tells us, this same Jesus that you saw leave will come in what? Amen. Amen. The Bible is clear and there's no need to be deceived. But look what Paul says in verse number 3. Let no man what? Answering the same thing that Jesus was answering in Matthew chapter 24, and he started with the same words that Jesus started with in Matthew chapter 24, let no man deceive you. Why is there so much confusion, brothers and sisters? Is God's word not clear? It's here in black and white, let no man deceive you. For that day, what day? Second coming of Christ, how do we know that? Verse number one. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except. In other words, the only way that the second coming of Christ is going to happen is if, here it is, except there come a what? A falling away first. Now in the Greek, the word here is apostasia or an apostasy or a leaving of the truth. And I dare say that even in our own church, people are leaving the truth. Brothers and sisters, I need to tell you something very clear and pointed. The truth is never going to change. I don't care if you were a millennial or you're an elder. The truth never changes. It never dies. And the message is not going to change just because you're young. (laughs) Praise the Lord. There must come a falling away, a leaving of the truth before Jesus returns. And we see it happening today. And there's so much contention and arguments and foolishness even within our own church. And we should be united with one purpose and that is to hasten the second coming of Christ. 
Brothers and sisters, don't look externally at other people to see how Jesus should act. If you want to know how Jesus should act, look in your word. And just because your other brothers and sisters don't live up to the standard, it doesn't mean that you can't. For we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is with me, whatever men may say. Jesus is walking and talking with us, and there's no need to leave the truth. That's why he said in Matthew 24 and verse 13, he that endures unto the end, the same will be saved. Keep on enduring. Push through. We do it on our jobs. We do it at our, at our house. We do it if we... Uh, does anyone ever save up money to buy things? We do it there. We save money and we save and we endure. No, I, I can't spend that money because I want this particular item. And we do it throughout the course of our life. But just let somebody say that you can live a righteous life in Christ and they'll say, no, you can't. It's not possible to endure. Brothers and sisters, we can overcome by the power of Christ. And and Paul says it clearly in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives where? In me. Christ is living in you. God is living in you. A... uh, How many times did Jesus sin, brothers and sisters? You have a sinless Savior living in you, according to Paul. And you say, I just can't help it. Brothers and sisters, you and I were bought with a price. We are more precious than fine gold to God. And he wants to use us. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans, I think it's chapter 10, that the whole world is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. The world is waiting on us to see if the things that we believe are really true. They want to know if you and I, who serve a living God, who is righteous in all his ways. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 6, in verses number 1 through 3, it says that, that, that Isaiah was looking up into the heavens and he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he saw the cherubims standing around with two wings they covered their face and with two wings they covered their feet and with two they did fly. And all they do day and night is cry, holy, 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 holy. And that holy God became man and and made an example for us and now he is living in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they are on one accord. There is no contention with the Godhead. And they are not fighting for power. But yet they exalt one another. So back to our scripture. I'm getting off topic here. There's no need to fall away from the truth if Christ be in you. The Bible says he that has been baptized into Christ has put on Christ. We have put on Christ. Okay, so one of the things that must take place before Jesus returns is that the gospel or this gospel must be preached around the world and there must come a falling away first. And we see both of those things happening even today. Number three is found in the same verse. I'm going to start back at the beginning of verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and, that's a conjunction, correct? In other words, these two things must take place, and the man of sin must be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse number four, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing that he is God. And look what Paul wrote in verse number five. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? The man of sin must be revealed to the whole world, and there's even confusion on who that is in our own church. 
And brothers and sisters, we like to quote the great controversy. We like to quote all these uh, reformers that came before us, and they knew this truth. And yet we're confused. It still can't be that same person. And men and women who died for this Bible that we have today knew that the Pope was this man of sin, this son of perdition. And it's clear through the scriptures. It's very clear. We don't need to change our opinions. We don't need to change God's word. It's still the same as it was yesterday. It's still the same as in 1844. It's still the same. The message has not changed. The gospel must be preached around the world and then shall the end come. There must come a falling away first and then shall the end come. The man of sin must be revealed and then shall the end come. Number four, number four. It's found in the Old Testament. We're gonna go to Malachi chapter four. You pardon my voice, please. Pray for me. Malachi chapter four. Number four. The gospel must be preached around the world, a falling away first, and the man of sin must be revealed. Number four, Malachi chapter four. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Amen. In verse number one. I read verse number one because I want you to have a context of what the scriptures are saying. It says, for behold, are you there, saints? Okay. It says, for behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall need that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So really quickly, has that day happened yet? Are the wicked still with us today? Okay, so this has not happened yet. Verse number two, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Uh, I, I want to pause here real quick because I want, you, I want, I want to give you some imagery that was very uh, impressionable to me. Uh, I was on that great, thank you, brother. I was on that great um, program or application called Facebook. <clears throat> and there was a picture of a, uh, like a farm and it was just spring and there had been a calf that had been born in the stall. And any of you who are farmers probably know this already. But there was a calf that was born in the stall over the winter, and it had not yet seen green grass. It had not yet gone out to pasture. And and this was the first day of spring, and the grass was green, and they opened the stall door, and I thought a gazelle was coming out of there. Never seen a cow jump so high. Maybe you don't see it, brothers and sisters. But that's what you and I will do when Jesus comes like we've never seen spring before. (laughs) Verse number three, and you shall tread down the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, saith the Lord of hosts. As you know, brothers and sisters, that the wicked are not ashes under our feet yet, but we know that those who are not standing on the side of Christ when Jesus returns will run to the rocks and to the mountains and say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. But here it is in verse number, number five. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The gospel must be preached around the world, and then the end will come. There must come a falling away first, and then the end will come. The man of sin must be revealed, and then the end will come. Jesus is going to send Elijah, and then the end will come. The four things that must take place before Christ returns. 
Who is Elijah? I thought John the Baptist was Elijah. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, it says that John the Baptist will go with the spirit and power of Elijah. He was not literally Elijah in the flesh, but he went with a message that was going to prepare the people to meet their Messiah. And that's what John the Baptist preached. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent. He was preparing the people to meet Jesus and they didn't take heed. And the whole nation at the end of the 70 weeks was cut off. Mercy. But brothers and sisters, you and I in this Adventist church are, have been called to be Elijah to the rest of the world to prepare a people for the second coming of Christ. And we have a message known as the Elijah message that is going to prepare people to meet, not their Messiah, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus isn't coming back to die on the cross again. For he died unto sin how many times? Once. Now he's coming back to redeem us, to take us home. But somebody needs to usher in the King. And there must be given a warning that will prepare people. And you and I, a lot oftentimes, brothers and sisters, I know that the enemy doesn't want this message to be heard, but I'm going to push through anyway. You and I oftentimes perceive warning as a negative act. And people say, oh, you're just an alarmist. The Bible says the trumpet has to give a certain sound. How are you know you're supposed to go to war if the trumpet is not blown? We are called to be repairs of the breach, restorers of paths to dwell in. We are to give hope to the world that Jesus, who loves them dearly, is about to come. And do you think that God is not going to hold us responsible for all the light given to us? All the conflict series, all the testimonies, ministry of healing, evangelism, all these compilations that we have, manuscript releases, now everything is available for you and for me. And do you think that God is going to hold us guiltless for having all of this information at our fingertips? But back to Elijah. There is an Elijah message that is going to prepare a people for the second coming, and it's found in Revelation chapter 14. We know it as the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages is the Elijah message, and you and I in the Adventist church are called to be Elijah. Elijah. Revelation chapter 14 and verse number six. And look how clear God has laid it out for us. Remember, the gospel must be preached around the world and then shall the end come. There must come a falling away first and then shall the end come. The man of sin must be revealed and then shall the end come. Elijah must come and then shall the end come. And all of those things are found here. Listen to the first angel's message, verse number six. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what? To preach to who? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It sounds like the gospel's going around the world. But it's not just Jesus died on the cross, but listen in verse number seven, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? Judgment is going on since 1844. Jesus is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And that's not going to change. The message is still true today. And we need to be warning people that there's a judgment. And it's not scary to tell people judgment is going on. For the Bible tells us that judgment is given to the saints of the Most High. In favor of us. This is good news. The gospel being preached around the world. Judgment is going on. 
and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Judgment. Listen to this, the second angel's message. And there followed another angel saying what? Babylon is, there must come a falling away first. The second angel's message proclaims that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and the same church that gave you Sunday is the same church that says you go straight to heaven when you die, or you go straight to hell when you die, or you go to purgatory. And forgive me for saying this, but the same one that gave you all those things gave you Christmas. Babylon is verily fallen. Brothers and sisters, no truth is, is of a lie, and no lie is of the truth. So either Jesus was born on December 25th or he wasn't. That's another sermon. The gospel must be preached around the world. The first angel's message. Babylon is fallen. There must come a falling away first. The second angel's message. And the man of sin must be revealed and it's found here in the third angel's message. And it says this in verse number nine. And there followed a third angel saying with a what? Loud voice. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Brothers and sisters, this is a warning and, and make no mistake about it. Romans chapter six and verse 16 says, whomever you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants to, are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. And the little things we do today will determine the outcome in the future. Amen. And you can say all you want, I'm ready for the test. You don't know what's coming. Brothers and sisters, all of your senses your eyes, your ears, your taste, your smell, your touch, everything will be taxed and you will say this is real. But we have to stand on God's word. And this is the defining factor. The next thing we see after these three angels' messages is the second coming of Christ. Look here in verse number 14. After the three angels' messages are given around the world, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. When we do our job as a church, as what God has called us to be, Jesus will come. It is in your power and my power to hasten the second coming of Jesus. And he is looking for a group of people that will devote their lives to him as much as they do to entertainment looking for a group of people that will devote their lives to him as much as they do to these things that we waste our time on. And I'm guilty myself. But brothers and sisters, we need now to make a decision. We need now to realign ourselves with the mission that God has called us to. The seven-day Adventist uh, this church that we belong to is not just a church, but it's a movement. We are to be constantly going forward and higher and higher, and Ellen White says still higher. Still higher. I want to go home. I know you do too. I want to eat from that tree of life. I can just imagine the fruit coming off of there before it even hits my mouth. Juices (laughs) Juices <laughs> coming out in all directions. I can't even imagine what that river of life looks like. I can't imagine the things that God has prepared for us. But more importantly, brothers and sisters, I can't imagine how I will feel when I see Jesus face to face for the first time. 
And based on what all happened to the other prophets, I would probably fall on my face as a dead man. I don't know what I will do. But I know this, that when I see him, I will be like he is. And brothers and sisters, that's what I want for each and every one of us in here today. There's no excuse not to make it into the kingdom. He has given us a sure way and a sure word of prophecy. And he has given us these things to assure our, 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 our victory in Christ. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, there are all these signs around us today. Speculations on how the earth will end. And theories that cause confusion in our world and even in our church. And I, I, I appreciate what Pastor Charles said. We waste our time on these conspiracy theories which lead nowhere. And the enemy is doing, you are doing exactly what the enemy has primed us to do. And that is to take our focus off of Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to appeal to you on the times in which we are living in the church in which you are called to, the movement that you are called to. And I want to ask that you will stand with your feet, stand on your feet with me and what I have here on the screen is slides of the three angels' message. And I would like for you and I to recite this together to remind in our conscience the, 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 the commitment that we made. Do you remember the first time you heard this message? I do. I was not born in the church. I was baptized on June 7, 2008. I was 27 years old. And the Lord brought me back from death. I was in the world dead, and I remember the first time I heard this message, the first time I stepped into an Adventist church, I heard the preaching of the Mark of the Beast. Never been in an Adventist church before. But brothers and sisters, I didn't hear judgment. I didn't hear uh, hatred. I didn't hear fire and brimstone. What I heard was good news, and I heard mercy. And even these messages that we preach that are hard are messages of mercy. Good news that God has given to us to prepare him, prepare us for his second coming. So as the, the slides here, I would like for you to recite these with me and, and we'll close in prayer. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receive the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, don't forget the message which you have been called to. Make your commitment today. Put these uh, verses to memory. Put them here in your heart, for there will be a time where you might be in need of one of these, and it will not be at your hand. Remember the, the high calling to which you and I have been called. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for another Sabbath and for this message, letting us know, Father, that we don't need to guess, we don't need to be confused, there's no need to, to be afraid, but you have given to us in your word things that will take place before you, re you return. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to remember the commitment that we had made at the beginning, not a commitment to the church, not a commitment to the kids, not a commitment to the pastor or the elders or any other position, but a commitment to you. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for pulling us out of darkness into this marvelous light. 
We thank you for your blessings, Lord. We are undeserving, and yet you have loved us with an everlasting love. Father in heaven, I pray that we will leave here with these commitments. All heaven took record and heard from our own voices the three angels' messages, and so today we are without excuse. And so we ask, Heavenly Father, now we are not able to commit, make these commitments or to keep them, but we need your help. We need you to work these things out in us and in time, Father, and, and, and give us the opportunity to overcome. Please, Father, help us to keep these commitments that we are making today. And I pray, Father, that we will, should you delay your coming, that we will make it back here next Sabbath to worship you in spirit and in truth. I thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer and for even giving a thoughtful, uh, this, this day, this time, to be able to worship you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.